Second Peter chapter 1. Um, we're picking up. This is our third installment in uh, Second Peter. There's so many great things that are, are here. We've, uh, I'm not going to recount all of them and all the message. I mean, we've taken two weeks already through the first uh, two-thirds of this chapter alone. But um, last time, the message was how Peter, knowing that he's putting off this tabernacle, remember what the tabernacle was, the, it's, it's a tent, right? And, and that he likened the tabernacle to his body and um, how he's going to be putting that off soon. What's at the very heart in the center of the tabernacle? But the Holy of Holies. And likewise, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, but in the same way, uh, we're the tabernacle uh, of the Holy Spirit as well. Those who are born again have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them at the very heart and the center of their lives. Um, and so as a result of that, um, Peter is saying, I'm about to put off this tabernacle, this, this skin. It's getting old and, and worn out. And where it used to have fur, it doesn't have fur anymore. And, and where it didn't have fur, it has it now. And you guys would know what I'm talking about along that line, especially the guys, where things grow. And anyway, so the point is, is he's putting this off, but he's saying, I want to put these things uh, in remembrance to you. He wants to emphasize that as he's putting off this tabernacle to, uh, first of all, make your calling and election sure. That we live in such a way that our calling and election is certain and sure for ourselves and for others. Uh, we just had, um, as, as Ted was saying, a, a great uncle. Um, this would be my father-in-law's brother who um, passed away last week. But um, he, was a, he was a man of God, and he was encouraging, he was full of joy, and the thing that was really wonderful about him is that we knew that he knew Jesus, and so there's absolute and total peace in that, and that's a gift that you can give to your loved ones for them to know that you are sold out on fire for Jesus Christ, that you are uh, desiring to give your life and to serve him all the days of your life to uh, fight the good fight, finish the uh, race, keep the faith, as we talked about last week. That that's what it comes down to, to make your calling and election sure and how we do that for us, but it's also to the benefit of those who are around us. So Peter tells them, you know, make your calling and election sure. And then he talks about his entrance into the everlasting kingdom. And then he, with that in mind, in remembrance to be established in the truth. And he wants to stir up. And remember that word for stirring up was to be awakened. It's almost like we can sometimes fall asleep. We can grow weary while doing good, but to be awakened. And so Peter, at the very last part, you know, he's coming to the end of his life. And what he's doing is he's coming and he's kicking the bed and saying, wake up. It's time to get up. It's not time to sleep. It's time to be awake. It's a time to be, you know, watchful and, and uh, mindful of the coming of the Lord Jesus. And then it goes on, putting off my tabernacle as Jesus has shown me. And we talked about how uh, in John chapter 21 that you remember, uh, do you love me, Peter? And, he, you know, that, that response, that dialogue. And then he told him, when you were young, you went where you wanted to go. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands. Someone else will gird you and uh, be, you'll be led where you don't want to be led. But that was a prophecy to Peter of what his end would be, that he would, he would be able to lay down his life for Jesus, which was, you know, when the cock crowed three times, he realized, I couldn't do that. Even though I professed to do it, I couldn't do it. He gets the prophecy that, oh, you'll be able to do it. You, you will love me to the degree that you'll be able to lay down your life for me. And then he says, and have these things after my decease always in remembrance. And it really tells us why he wrote First Peter and Second Peter, is to drive home the idea that we need to be watchful, we need to be aware of the Lord, that his coming is soon, and so on. So we pick up from the, that idea, putting things into remembrance. In five verses, he uses that phrase three times last week. And so now we pick up into verse 16. And he goes on with the things that he wants them to remember. 
He says specifically, he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we'll get more down to what this eyewitnesses to his majesty was about, but notice how it starts. He says, after telling them to remember, to remember, to remember, and to be awake, he's, he's there to stir them up, to, to, to shake them up a little bit, shake us up, to be awake. He says, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. We didn't follow um, something that was just um, a made-up story. We, we followed something that was, was true, that we were actually eyewitnesses of. Where it says cunningly devised fables, cunningly devised the word there in the Greek is sophizo, which means specifically like a sinister plan. A sinister plan. We didn't follow some sort of sinister plan, some sort of thing to try to convince people of a lie. We followed something that was true. In fact, there's a theology, or actually it's a false theology called sophism. It's a philosophy. And it's about gaining knowledge, and it's about gaining understanding, but it's gaining understanding not so that you have that to give away, but it's about gaining understanding so that you could be the, the wise one. It's all self-oriented. It's all person-oriented. So if we're sophisticated, then usually that sophistication is built upon some lie that we are better than we actually are, but we want to create this this understanding with other people that, oh, I'm very wise and sophisticated and, and very sharp. And usually people that are like that, they use words that you don't understand. And if you ask them to teach you, that they'll teach you, but it'll be in a confusing way. One of the hallmarks of, of a teacher and, and a good teacher is somebody that can convey the difficult truths even, the things that are hard to understand, to convey them and put them into a, um, you know, into some sort of framework that anybody could understand. Whether it's a very young child, or if it's somebody that it's not necessarily all there, that it's okay. You can still convey that. So for me, I always go before the Lord. I say, God, with whatever understanding I may have, help me to be able to convey the simple truths, but even the complex things of the Lord to convey those so that they're easily understood and, and they're digestible, as opposed to somebody who's sophisticated. So Peter said, we didn't, we didn't um, generate or create some sort of cunningly devised fable. We didn't follow after something that was sophisticated and, and high and lofty that, that you had to be just part of a special group to understand. No, this was for, for all people to understand that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He laid down his life. He went to the cross when he said, it is finished at the end of him taking all of that burden and punishment upon him, that that was for your sin and for my sin, and it is finished. And that, that's a very simple thing for us to understand. We know what it is to work, and we know what it is to... You know, back in school, we hear the bell ring, hey, we're done with class. Or we, we may, if we work in a plant or a factory, we hear that bell ring, hey, we're done with work, we're on a break. And for Jesus to say, it is finished, lays the groundwork for us to know that now we've ceased from our works, that our sin is atoned for through Jesus Christ by faith. And we have such peace, we can have such peace in that as we believe it. So... Peter saying, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. And that word fables there, the word in the Greek is muthos. It's where you get the myths or a, a myth, something that's false or fiction, something that's not true. We didn't follow some sort of, you know, intricately uh, devised philosophy that, that isn't even true. We followed something that was, that was true. In fact, we followed the one that epitomizes the truth. As you know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. So that's, uh, what is that, John 14, 6, right? Yeah. So that we end up coming to that place where not only did we know what the truth is, we knew who the truth was. Not only did we know the way, we know who the way was. 
<laughs> I don't even know if I said that in the, in the white way. Anyway, um, and then the truth. We didn't even know about the truth, but we do the person, the personification of truth. So with that said, we, you know, this is what Peter's following. And then it says, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't let anybody tell you, don't let anybody tell you that the apostles were not looking for or anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. They were. They thought that he was going to come at their time. And because the Lord would tarry doesn't mean that he's still not coming. This is the whole point of, of really the second chapter of this particular book. That, you know, God's not willing that any would perish, but come to repentance. That that his time frame isn't the same as our time frame, but the very fact that he hasn't come yet is because of his love for us. What if he had come in 1970? Where would we have been? Some of you wouldn't have even been born. So I guess you miss out on eternal life because you were never born. Or if he came in 1980, where were you at? I know for me, I was not walking with the Lord in 1980. If he came in 1980, then that would have meant the next seven years, I would have been cast into the tribulation. But it was because of his grace and his mercy that he's waited. That he's waited even right now that there are people that, as we, as we read, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, until the church, the Gent predominantly Gentile, until that becomes complete and that closes, will the plan that was begun in the very beginning, through Israel, will pick up with Israel. And this is the Daniel prophecy of the 70 weeks. We have 69 weeks of seven years. And then we have the last 70th week of seven years, which is the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the time when God pours out his wrath upon the world. But it's also a time when the church is caught up before that, and those who are saved after that they'll become martyrs they'll be saved but they will become martyrs and god will fulfill or complete his plan through israel coming as its messiah as its king to reign in jerusalem and we're waiting for a third temple to be built that will i'm not even sure that that's the temple that jesus will be in because in zechariah it talks about how he's going to build the temple it's not going to be some pagan people or maybe israelites or or the zionists to build the temple and then for some antichrist pagan to to dwell in it and then to draw attention to himself i don't even know about that it seems to be that there's a fourth temple and we haven't even gotten to the third yet but the point being, of course, is that the apostles were expectant. John, the, we were talking about this in our men's study yesterday. The very, you know, two verses from the last, um, you know, in the last chapter of the book of Revelation is emphasizing, I'm coming quickly. He's coming quickly quickly emphasizing that the Lord's return is at any moment and this is where we need to have that eager expectation of his return that it affects how we live and so John had that Paul talked all about it you know about this in the epistles first Thessalonians second Thessalonians first Corinthians and so on but then we also see where Peter is talking about it and he's saying we haven't followed some sort of cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when they when Jesus came the first time he didn't come in the power that they expected he didn't come to set things straight not in the world not in the way politically that they had wanted he set things straight spiritually he set things straight with regard to sin and uh, reconciliation to God. That's where he set things straight. That was a greater thing than his coming, you could argue, because he made reconciliation for sin, and he conquered sin and death. So with this said, when he made known to us the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus, but then he goes on, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Eyewitnesses of his majesty. And here we see him quoting 
or making reference to what we see in all three of the four Gospels in Matthew 17, in Mark 9, and in Luke chapter 9. It's the transfiguration. So he's talking about this. This had a profound impact. We didn't follow cunningly devised fables. We, we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They saw Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigure before them. And when he transfigured, when he went from just ordinary threads to, to robes that were cleaner and brighter, and it was like looking at the sun. Anyone looked at the sun lately? Today's a good day. We can see the sun. So if you want to just get a feel for the transfiguration, go look at the sun today and you'll know what they saw. All right, not long. Not long. We want you to be able to read your Bible after you look at the sun. So <laughs> the point being is that he, he changed before them. And it was just a mind blower. Then what ends up happening? He ends up having a conversation with two others, Moses and Elijah. Just an amazing thing that he had this conversation with Moses and Elijah. And you know the story. Peter said, well, let's, let's make three tabernacles, Lord. One for you, and then, of course, assumed Moses and Elijah. And the, these tabernacles, these tents, would be almost these places to meet, a place of, of worship, right? The tabernacle of old was where they came to meet with God. Jesus tabernacled among us, that he was the example of uh, not just the example, he was the one to whom you would meet God. All the fullness of the glory of God was found in Jesus Christ. Amazing. And so Peter says, well, let's build a tabernacle. Let's, let's worship. And we'll worship here where, where Moses is, or I'm sorry, where you are, Jesus, and then we'll worship where Moses is, who represents the law, and we'll worship where Elijah is, who represents the prophets. Yeah, this is great. We'll worship all three. And then what happens? Then there's this voice from God that they heard. The voice of God comes down upon them. And he says, this is my son. Listen to him. Second time that it had happened. Remember when he was baptized? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And then a dove rests upon his shoulder as a symbol or as a work of the Holy Spirit. You could almost say, I don't want it, to, well, it's, it's like that was the beginning of his ministry. That was like the, if you want to call it this, and don't, don't, you know, just, it would be similar to when Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high, that, that they waited in Jerusalem and then the ministry wasn't supposed to start until they were filled with the Holy Spirit all the way in them and overflowing out of their lives. That's what we see at Pentecost. That it's as though the same thing is seen with Jesus. Here he is, he's beginning his ministry. No, no miracles, apparent miracles before this. And you know, you may have those spurious books that talk about all oh, the miracles of Jesus between when he was 12 and walking around in Egypt or whatever, and then in Galilee, Galilee and Nazareth. It's not in the Bible, discount it, okay? But what we see is that his ministry did begin at 30. He was baptized, and then we see the physical evidence of the Holy Spirit upon him as a dove. So you can kind of liken it to being like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. His ministry is beginning. And what people would see is the power of the Holy Spirit upon his life, not only within it. At Pentecost, what people would see is not the just the power of Jesus Christ being born again within them, but that it would be upon them. So when you would see them minister, you would see Peter, you would see, the, you would see Stephen before he was martyred, one of the deacons, that you would see them, but then you knew there's something different. There's, this is, this is the, the, the glory of God. This is the Spirit of God upon their lives. And you actually have that preposition, not only in them, but upon epi, that it's upon their lives. And I say this because we have the same thing for us. That when we go out into the, in doing the work of the ministry, that we ask God, fill us, fill us to, 
you know, fill us up where we're empty. Fill us with your spirit, God. But fill us not only with your spirit, but to overflowing. So when people see us do the work of the ministry, that when we speak, it is the word of God that comes forth. That just as Jesus, or just as Peter said, when you speak, speak as though the oracles of God. And that it isn't just speaking the word of God, but that there's a, that there's a power and there's a, an authority that comes with it. And it's not because you or I have power of a, or authority, but it's because we believe in the work and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and upon our lives to accomplish what he wants to do in other people's lives. And so we pray this, God, anything that I do, help me to do it under your power and your inspiration. Fill me to overflowing, Lord. And so Peter's talking about this and that they were eyewitnesses of this. But then what ended up happening? Well, the, this, you know, the, this word came, this cloud came, and then, um, then they hear, this is my son, and you, you know, listen to him. And then all of a sudden, Moses and Elijah disappear. They're not there anymore. All they see is Jesus. He's the one to follow. That Moses bore witness to Jesus. Elijah bore witness to Jesus. We bear witness to Jesus. No one falls down or worships us. And if they do, we say, get up. You're worshiping the wrong person. You need to worship Jesus. Follow him. Even angels when John did this and began to fall down before the angel, he says, hey, I'm a fellow servant like you. Worship Jesus. That's what it all comes down to. Simple, easy. Just worship Jesus. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the outgrowth of that. Watch that work out to where you love other people, where you love your neighbor as yourself, where you start to have concerns and interests in, in their well-being. Start to look at how you can be a blessing to them. That you come to church even and you're thinking, how can I be a blessing to the other people that are here? I'm not here to get blessed. I'm here to be used, to be a, a vessel for blessing. What a different mindset. But to really come in with the idea of I'm going to bless someone. I'm, it's my role, it's my job to be involved in blessing someone, to make their life better, not worse. To help them. So, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So, in verse 17 it says, and after six days, I'm sorry, in Matthew 17 it says, and after six days Jesus taking uh, Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth, bringing them up to a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elijah, talking with him. And they answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spoke, uh, spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. So, again, this is in Matthew uh, 17, but it's also recounted in Mark and, and in Luke. So let's move on, and then we'll, we'll come to some more about this. So verse 17 of... Uh, this chapter, 2 Peter 1, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. When we were with him in the holy mount. You know what's interesting about this is that they were at this Mount of Transfiguration. And we know it generally as the Mount of Transfiguration, right? But the thing that's interesting, and I like where some other teachers have gone with this, and it's an interesting thing, is that there's a mountain on the other side of the Jordan. And it's called Mount Nebo. Some know it as Mount Pisgah. It's about, I don't know, uh, 12 miles or so from the Jordan river on the other side 
So on the Jordanian side, it's not in Israel. And um, you would come to that, and it's, it's so if you have like the, the Dead Sea, and uh, my hand is not going to help this, I'll just, you have the Dead Sea, and then to the east of the Dead Sea, you have Mount Nebo. And from Mount Nebo, you can see Jericho. You can actually see all of the Promised Land when it's clear. You can see into Jerusalem because it's about, I don't know, 2,700 uh, feet in elevation. And keep in mind, that's by the Dead Sea, so it's actually higher than it would seem, right? Because the Dead Sea is below sea level. And so you can see Jerusalem and Bethlehem and so on from that spot. 12 miles from the Jordan and about 17 miles from Jericho. You can see Jericho. You can see it all. And the interesting thing about this is that um, that this is the place where Moses was when the Lord said, okay, I'm going to show you the promised land, but then this is where it ends for you. You don't get to enter into the promised land. After 40 years, the children of Israel had been wandering through the desert, and then they come in on the opposite side of where the Dead Sea is, and they come to Mount Nebo. And the Lord says, I want you to go on up to Mount Nebo. And specifically, it says, uh, let's see, let me read it here. I thought I had it. Yeah, then Moses went from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah. Uh, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan. Um, so from Mount Nebo, he was able to see. But that's where he stopped. That's where his ministry was. That's where he died, was at the top of Mount Nebo. Which is interesting because this is the same place where it appears that Jesus was at with the disciples. Another thing that's interesting, you remember when um, Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind. You remember that they, they went from Israel, that they came to that place of the Jordan, and then he took off his mantle, and then he struck the water there at the Jordan, and then the water of the Jordan parted, and then he and Elisha were able to pass through on dry ground, and they ended up going toward the, um, toward the east. And they continued to go toward the east. And after they left, then the water closed up and continued to flow. And uh, the Jordan continued as, as such. So they kept going and, and Elisha was following him. He knew that he was going to receive the mantle. And uh, Elijah said specifically, he said, well, if you're with me when I'm taken then you'll get the mantle, you'll, you'll get the, the covering, you'll get the coat, right? So they continue to go east, and it's believed that the place where Elijah was caught up in the whirlwind, can you guess where that would be? Mount Nebo, there at Mount Nebo. That he was caught up at the base of Mount Nebo, and as he's going up, that his mantle falls, and then Elisha gets the mantle, and then heads back over to the other side, strikes the Jordan River, crosses again on the dry ground, gets to the other side, and then the, the prophets, the school of the prophets, they're saying, hey, what, what happened to Elijah? And he says he was caught up. So they said, well, maybe he's coming back down. So they end up looking around the region in case for some reason he's caught up in a tornado and he's been dropped off somewhere, you know, just falls out of the sky somewhere. And he says, you can look, but you're not going to find anything. And, of course, they didn't find anything. They didn't find Elijah, but then they recognized that Elisha had Elijah's mantle. And then they began to, and this is the school of the prophets, and this is the, you know, the, the work. He had a lot of interaction with the school of the prophets. We talked about that yesterday at the men's study, right? So, the thing that's interesting about this is that when John the Baptist, and I know this sounds like a left field thing, but when John the Baptist um, came on the scene, when his ministry began, um, they came to him, and it says actually in John 1, it says, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites. So this is uh, John 1, 19, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So 
the Jews and the um, the priests and the Levites were expecting the Messiah. Amen. This was not a new idea. They they knew the Messiah was due to come. And in fact, it wasn't 30 years before that they're hearing stories about what had happened in Bethlehem and the shepherds declaring these things. And then, of course, he had Herod. He goes and he, he kills everyone that's all the uh, babies two years old and under from Bethlehem. He kills all of them. He hears about uh, that... Um, circumcision or the time when he's dedicated when when um, you have the oh gosh I should have remembered their names um, the the two the old lady and the old man who were there at the temple anyone remember the names Simeon, Simeon and Anna. Anna okay thank you Simeon and Anna and when they've been waiting for the Messiah then they see him and it's this is the Messiah and the Lord reveals it to them so there's that rumor that's going around. And then there's that one Passover that they get together and Jesus is 12. And there he is in the temple. And he's talking to all of these uh, other, you know, other leaders in the temple. And he's discussing the Lord. He's discussing the Heavenly Father. And they're blown away. It's just like, this is a 12-year-old kid. This is awesome. So his reputation was present, right? And they knew that the Messiah was coming, but not only because of that, not only because of that, but because of the scripture that spoke of the fact that he was coming. They knew the, the prophecy of the 69 weeks and, and that they were down to the, they were coming up on the day when, when he would make this triumphal entry that they would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They knew that he was coming. They understood this. They were students of, of prophecy. They also understood that Elijah was supposed to precede them. As we read in Malachi, it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So they knew that, that Elijah was coming, and John the Baptist was kind of like him. And so they asked him, Who are you? What then? You know, he says, I'm not the Christ. Which is always a good thing to remember. If someone ever comes to you, you say, first, I'm not Jesus, man. Okay, so let's just make that clear. I'm not going to be able to solve all your problems, especially as a pastor. Hey, I can be Pastor Rock, but I'm definitely not the Christ. But I can direct you to him. I can introduce you to him. So they said, well, who are you? And then, art thou Elias? And he said, I'm not. Are you Elijah? And he says, I'm not Elijah. So they knew by the prophecy that Elijah was going to precede Jesus. But he asks them, are you Elijah? No. And even though John came in the power and the, and the ministry of Elijah, this wasn't before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So this tells us that Elijah is coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But it wasn't him here. It was just John the Baptist. And then it goes on and it says... And he saith, I'm not, and art thou that prophet? <clears throat> and then he said, no. What's that prophet that he's talking about? You know, are you that one? Well, in Deuteronomy 18, and specifically I'm reading from verse 15, it says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And then he goes on and says, and if, if, if he says something and it doesn't come to pass, that he's bogus. He's not really a prophet. So it gives us the overview of what true prophets are, that there's a legitimacy, there's a credibility to them, that there's an accuracy to their prophecies as well. But the point is, is that they're asking, are you Elias? Are you Elijah? Nope, I'm not Elijah. I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah, and I'm not that prophet. Who, who are they talking about? Who are they making reference to? They're talking about someone that would come that would be just like Moses, according to Deuteronomy 18. So they're anticipating, they're looking for the prophet. They're looking for who the prophet is not only somebody that's like Moses, but it's also the Messiah, that the prophet would be the Messiah, that he would have a prophetic ministry. So it, they're sort of likening the Messiah to the prophet, but they don't really know. So they know that for sure there's someone that's going to be like Moses on the scene, 
there's someone that's going to be like Elijah on the scene, and we know that you know, the Messiah is going to be on the scene. So what do we have at the Mount of Transfiguration? An awesome, awesome thing that these two witnesses, and I think that these two witnesses, you can, you can recount them, you can find them. I was just reading through Zechariah. There's a reference to these uh, two olive trees that end up being the, the witness before the great day of the Lord. These two olive trees. That when Jesus is there at Mount Nebo, more than likely, that he's got two other guys that are probably pretty familiar with Mount Nebo as well. That would be Moses, who died on Mount Nebo, and somehow you know the story that there was, according to the Jew, there was a wrestling between Satan and Michael about his, his body. Why would Satan be so concerned about the body of, of Moses? Well, maybe Moses has some other work to do that relates to the end. And we see those two witnesses in the book of Revelation as well, who by all accounts appear to be Moses and Elijah, which would make sense because that would be the prophet who comes, and that would be Elijah who comes before, as Malachi writes, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the return of Jesus Christ. This is another reason why it appears that the there's other things when we get to Revelation, we'll see that it, the way it breaks down, but it appears that Moses and Elijah are the witnesses through the second half of the trip. They, they go right up to that, then they die, and then their, their bodies are left in Jerusalem for three days, and then they're quickened to life and then raptured, and then now there's no witness, but then we have... That's because that comes right at the, you know, right at the sixth, fifth, and sixth trumpet. That then, then you have the return of Jesus Christ at that point, and then the bowl judgments are poured out. So I don't know. We can talk about that if I've just thrown you off with too many details here. But the point is, is you have Mount Nebo, and you have Peter, James, and John, and they see Jesus with Moses and Elijah, and they're talking about. What? What's going to happen? What the future is? What the future is having to do with the cross, perhaps, or what the future is as far as the great and coming day of the Lord, the dreadful day of the Lord. The point is, is that, <clears throat> is that they proceed. And this is a wonderful thing about these two witnesses in Revelation 11, as well as what we see Moses and Elijah in the anticipation. Fire from their mouths. If they're hurt, then anyone... Uh, you know, that does this, they'll be killed in the same manner. They shut heaven, no heaven for three and a half years, or no, no heaven, no, no rain for three and a half years. That's Elijah there. Power over water to turn it to blood. That's Moses. Smite the earth with all plagues. It's Moses. That these witnesses are going to have the same characteristics. They're, I believe, going to be Moses and Elijah, which is pretty breathtaking to think that actual the the Moses and the Elijah would be here on the earth, our earth in Jerusalem, and people would be trying to kill them and they can't kill them, and anyone that tries to kill them would perish by fire coming forth from them. I mean, this is a reality. This isn't a cunningly devised fable. But with all of that said, with all of that in mind, that Moses and Elijah are here and are probably you know, coming, what does Peter say? And this is the, the closing here, but we've got three verses. I've only done two so far. So here we come to verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What is he saying? We were eyewitnesses. We saw Moses and Elijah. We heard them speak. We heard even better. We heard the voice of God say, this is my son. Right? This is remarkable stuff for Peter, James, and John to have beheld. But then what does he say? What does Peter say next? Important. So important that it should now cause us to read our Bibles every day, all the time, to commit these things to memory. Believe me, I'm doing that. We need to do that. That as I understand that Peter is saying, we have something that's better than hearing the voice of God personally. 
we have something that's better than seeing Moses and Elijah and Jesus transfigured. We have a more sure word of prophecy. God's word is more certain than any experience or empirical evidence. Empirical evidence, meaning sen sensory evidence. What we see, what we taste, what we smell, what we touch. We have people that are trying to gauge our origins based upon empirical evidence when God has already told us what our origins are through his word. And somehow they're trying to come to this. And I believe to some degree, maybe it's a scientific experiment. They're trying to debunk the biblical account. But all they're finding is that, no, it's, it's more true than they thought it was. And so Peter is saying, man, I have experienced as much as any man can experience. My mind is being blown. I've heard the voice of God. How many of us have done that? I've seen and walked with Jesus. How many of us have done that? I've seen Moses and Elijah. How many of us have done that? And he's saying, you know what? But even more um, credible, but even more trustworthy than what I've seen, what James saw, and what John saw, is what we all are privy to and have access to, and it's the more sure word of prophecy. It's God's word we have before us. And he's trying to stir us up. Remember, he's, he's saying, you got to remember this, man. Don't go after the things that you see or that, you know, all this other stuff in the world. Don't be persuaded or don't be put into fear because of those things. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Understand his word, that it's a more sure word of prophecy. It's more certain than anything else. Whereunto, he says, ye do well that you take heed. You know, if you, if you hold fast to God's word, you're going to do well if you take heed to it. What's the difference between getting to the end, as Paul did, and again, quoting that verse from last week, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith, to be able to come to that place, we would do well to take heed so that we can finish well, so that we can get to the end. And this is why we're memorizing Scripture. This is why I'm... I'm, you know, I'm very active in this lately, not because I want to just have scriptures, but I found that as I memorize scripture, and I've, I've done this over the course, but especially lately, over the last, I don't know, couple, couple months, I've really been getting into scripture memory because I'm finding that it changes my perspective of things. One of the verses we went through in the first part, you know, add to your faith virtue, character. Who are you? And then knowledge. And then from there, temperance. Self-control. And then from there, add to your faith, patience, long-suffering. Then godliness. Then brotherly kindness. Then love or charity. Unconditional love but that we're supposed to be adding to this. So I'm finding that as I memorize that verse, that it reminds me to add to those things, to be mindful of these things. That yes, I believe, but now I need to start working on my character. And I need to start working on, you know, what, what is the, the understanding of God's word? What is the knowledge of it? Have you read through the Bible? You know, to have, have you done that? Start. Read through the Bible. Start to know what it says. And then, you know, again, it get, then self-control. It's, it's amazing that the more you know of the Bible, the more self-control you have. And then the more patience you have, if, so you have self-control. You see what I'm saying? And that's just one verse. It's one verse that we went through two weeks ago that we can memorize. It's not singular. It's not just pastor memorizes it. I didn't have to memorize it. But I'm, I realize the value of it, and so we can too. And so we have a more sure word of prophecy, a more sure word of, of God's word that's given to us. And we do well to take heed to it. And then it says, as unto a light that shines in a dark place. When, when we don't know what's going on and we're discouraged and we're depressed and we're in a dark place, it's funny how the word of God lifts us out of that. 
Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We're in a dark place, so we have to seek him out and say, I've got to find something to rejoice over in the Lord. One verse. But that we apply those things and we, we know them and then we have faith in it. I believe that that's true. That we rejoice in the Lord always and we, you know, again, we do it. We rejoice again. So as we're implementing these things, it says, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. He's basically saying, okay, we can continue to live in the dark place, but as we take heed to the prophecy, as we take heed to God's word, guess what? Light. You know, the same light that, that, that they saw, like, like looking at the sun, he's saying that that begins to be blossom it begins to grow it begins to happen as a day star it begins to dawn in your life so it's dark but then the word of god begins to dawn and and begins to come forth and now it's just like the awesome thing most of us see sunsets we don't see sunrises because we're not awake for them right <laughs> but you know we see that and and when you wake up and you see the sunrise you think that is beautiful that's glorious it's wonderful and it's the difference between being in the dark and then the word of God brings forth and begins to rise and you think, God is beautiful. And I know it sounds like a hippie thing, but then you start saying, God is love, man. God is beautiful, man. You know, and you start to get kind of emotional about it, but it's what God is doing because you've been in a dark place. Because I've been in a dark place. We've all been in these dark places. And the word of God is what lifts us out of it. Okay, so as it continues, it rise in your hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. In other words, prophecy has a specific um, ordained purpose that's public. It's not like somebody has, hey, I got a prophecy and it's mine and all mine and I've got the hidden meaning and no one else knows it. No one has that. In fact, if they do, you need to dismiss that. If anyone has some sort of secret prophecy or secret knowledge of something, some sophisticated thing, then you need to reject it. Because what ends up happening is God's word is for the public. Yes, it might come in parables. It may not be understood by everyone in the world, but it's understood by those who are born again. And so we come to that understanding and we say, wow, this is an awesome thing. It's a prophecy. It's a word of God. And other people are saying, yeah, that's, that's a truth. It's not something that's hidden and secret and, and uh, you can only know it, you know, how some of these uh, YouTube things are. Well, you know, we've got the answer to losing weight or, or to being more, you know, healthy or more sane or and whatever these things are. You know, you got all these promises, but then they say, but you got to watch this. And usually it goes on for four hours. They don't tell you how long it goes on for. And at the end, you've got to invest all this money just to find out what they were talking about. Because they always go, oh, okay, well, before I tell you the secrets, let me tell you some more. And then they keep you going. So within five minutes, you can just write that off as sophisticated nonsense and reject it. And just go back to the truth of God's word, the veracity of it. So let's wrap up here. Knowing this first, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. No one's got the corner on the market. Um, Ecclesiastes, the thing that has been done, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It's already, it's been already of old time, which was before us. So he's really emphasizing here that, you know, even new prophecies, be careful with those. Because they're, they're really, it's, it's all been here all this time. And... By and large, the, the people of God are going to have some familiarity. Okay, last verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And this is really the understanding. Hey, what is it about you know, the Bible being, you know, it's just written by all these you know, men and, and so on. What's the deal with that? 66 books, 40 authors. How do we know that it's legitimate? Well, this verse tells us a little bit about it. First of all, it's holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. If we don't even know who the holy men were that wrote it, then you can dismiss it. There, there are certain books that are like, hey, the, the Gospel of Timothy. 
that's that's you know ghost written. It's not by the Holy Spirit. It's written by someone else who said, "Well, I don't, you know, my name's Fred, uh, so that's not really credible as a, an apostle. So I'm going to go with Timothy. I'm going to change the name of it to Timothy, right? So if your name is Fred, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. I'm just or say that that's a non-apostolic name. But the point is, is that you know Timothy was more apostolic. So someone wrote something and then ended up. You know, saying, and it's the, the book or the gospel of Timothy. And just, look, just stick with the ones we know, right? Stick with the ones we know. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were writing, Paul's writing, he's, he's uh, you know, they're dictating, as we know, Peter was dictating this, and he's dictating, but then he's led by the Spirit. It's like a sermon or something that's coming forward, and then you find you, it, it, they look back on it and say, wow, I didn't even realize how inspired this was. I was fully aware of what I was saying. It wasn't under some trance or something, but, but I didn't realize. They're, they're holy men who know and understand doctrine. They're giving it forward, forth, and then it ends up being acknowledged this was inspired. They didn't say, hey, I wrote this and it's inspired. They wrote it. They passed these letters around and other people were saying, this is inspired. That's from Peter the Apostle. Hey, this is inspired. That's from Paul the Apostle. This is from John here. This is Luke. It's, it's Paul's account, but it's through Luke. And Luke's always been trustworthy, right? So, holy men of God. Holy men of God. There's always an identification of their holiness, that they're men of God, but they were moved by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit. And the prophecy didn't come in time of old by the will of man. It didn't just come because, hey, I think I want to write some sort of spiritual thing. Zechariah wasn't thinking that. Moses wasn't writing that. They wrote as they were led and directed by the Lord. So with that said, let's take heed to the things that the Lord has done, that unto us there's a light that shines in a dark place, and the day will dawn and the day star will arise in our hearts as we trust the Word of God. That's why I teach it. That's why we spend so much emphasis on it. That's why so many pastors teach it. That's why there's so much emphasis around it, verse by verse, so that you will go from darkness to light. That's my deepest desire as a pastor, and I know for other pastors that we would go from darkness to light and that there would be this encouraging, and we would say, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. It's glorious, just as we've tried to uh, describe a sunrise. You can't do it, but you just, if you could, you try to take a picture, it doesn't quite do it, but you remember, man, the, the colors, the vividness, the glory. And I will say this, that as we venture into the Word more and more, personally and together, that the light, the dawn will come and we'll, we'll begin to see it and it'll just be glorious. And we'll praise God for who he is because he's worthy to be praised. Amen? Amen? So Lord Jesus, thank you for the very fact that we have a more sure word of prophecy and that your, your graciousness is...